Wheeland Presley Funeral Home and Crematory, a proud supporter of WQPT, has been serving Quad City families since 1889. They now have live stream capabilities for viewing your loved one's funeral or memorial service. At IHM VCU, we've always been here for you. You are and always will be our top priority. We care about your financial and physical health, and we are here. IHM VCU is a proud supporter of WQPT. A chance to help parents find childcare while also educating students. And the Republican view of the Illinois tax plans in the cities. Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker unveiled his $45 billion 2022 budget, calling for some tax freezes, property tax relief, debt payments, and investments in education, policing, and other government agencies. In a moment, we talk with a top Republican in our area about the party's response. But first, child care. It's proving to be one of the biggest hurdles facing the jobs economy across the country and here in the cities. Western Illinois University is instituting new initiatives that could help both parents and students. Now, for one thing, Western is taking over an empty office space in downtown Moline to offer some much needed child care help. We talk with Dr. Lindsay Meeker, who is helping spearhead this partnership between the city, developers and the university. Just how desperate are families right now seeking child care. I mean, it's, it's getting to be a critical position. We know that nationwide, um, the number one reason families are citing is the inability to get back into the workforce following the pandemic is, is just, I mean, it's the number one, it's child care. We can't go back to work because we don't have child care for our children, especially um, infant to toddler range is extremely difficult. Um, because even places that have four-year-old preschool a lot of times don't have those birth to three options in the way that are necessary for people to get back to work. Um, Q2030, along with Skip Along Family Services and United Way, did a study prior to the pandemic noting almost a lack of like 7,000 child care spaces in the Quad Cities and that was before the pandemic and we know we've lost child care options since then so we know that program that problem has only grown so we can um and how that data kind of came about was we looked at the number of children ages birth to five the number of child care slots available and did the math and we came up with approximately seven thousand short now of course not everybody sends their child to a community-based child care or, or um, public preschool option but that, that sets the stage for a really big shortage in our area. We know that waiting, we have waiting lists upon waiting lists for the, the programs that we do have. Um, I have personally interviewed some parents in the last couple of weeks and I'm able to share a little bit, but one parent that I interviewed indicated that she has had to send her small children to live with her mother during the week because she cannot find childcare. So in order to get back to her public teaching job in public education in our community, she's had to send her child somewhere else. And that's with a parent. So she has that option, but I think that gives us a picture of how desperate the situation kind of is right now. And it's being recognized by Western Illinois University in a number of different initiatives, one being announced just uh, recently, the expansion into the enterprise lofts uh, in the heart of Moline. That's what's got you really excited right now, among other things. Why is that so important? That is really exciting for me right now. Um, it's been about a two year project of, of kind of planning and thinking and, and trying to figure that out and lots of help from community um, mentors. So we are looking to open that for childcare slots, which is, you know, truly desperate, but also in addition to that, a workforce development site. So in the meantime, and over the last couple of years, even prior to my arrival at Western, Western has shown up to be part of the workforce development kind of solution. And so we started with the Gateways grant, and that grant was for both um, students served in McCollum and Quad Cities. And what that grant did was allow work, um, 
early childhood workforce to be able to come back to school to grow their degree pathway um, so that they could reach teacher certification. And then the state came in and said, hey, this is a huge problem and we're going to bring something to the table. So right now there's a grant out there for early childhood workers to be able to get, get their tuition paid for through the um, Equity Access Consortium out of the state of Illinois. There's actually legislation that's accompanying that and they can go back and get their degree and that cost is covered. And that was one of the, the huge barriers because the pay in early childhood is just ridiculously low. We, the other advocacy point we need is, is pay equity, but now they're able to upskill um, without the barrier of the cost. And Western is working alongside Blackhawk College to be able to provide a complete pathway for our Quad City students in that workforce kind of group of people so that they can get all the way to their Pell, which is their professional educator license. We're offering online classes, we're offering in-person mentoring or Zoom support mentoring. Um, we are working with both school districts and community childcare partners to recruit. So that is a huge effort happening right now. Why the center is so cool is that's going to be a great space for people to be able to get hands-on experience within their programs, whether they're in a non-traditional program, traditional early childhood program, which has been welcomed back to the Quad City campus this fall. So I'm so excited to be a part of that, as well as some of our high schools. Our high schools are currently looking at the teacher shortage, one of those being early childhood, but we have lots of teacher shortage areas across the state of Illinois, including EL bilingual, science educators, early elementary education, um, all of those pieces. Um, are having shortages. So our local high schools are coming to the table and we're partnering with them as well. Earlier in the fall, we did a field trip with Bowling High School Grow Your Own Teachers. We also met with the early childhood program students out of the East Moline School District. I think this site can provide a really neat option for us to look at things like CDA on the way, which is like stepping high schoolers into that first certification for working in early childhood. I think it gives opportunities for after school, um, hands-on experiences, maybe even during the day, depending on the student's schedule. So I think it opens up lots of workforce development options. I also plan to utilize it with um, parent engagement and family empowerment. So we'll be able to use that space to have an early childhood parent mentor program. It also, interestingly enough, has a, a Spanish bilingual learning component to it. Why is that a part of it and why is that so important? Well, so our, our community is very multilingual and we're blessed with that. What a gift to have in our community. Many of our school districts uh, um, serve multilingual learners. East Moline, Moline, Rock Island, you're looking at approximately 25% of their kindergartners being multilingual learners. And across, you know, maybe 16 to 20 languages even in some of those districts. One of our high incidents languages that occurs outside of English is Spanish. And we're looking to think about how do we provide a multilingual experience and which community would make sense to try to serve in that way. And right now it's Spanish in our community. So we're looking to do that. The multilingual experience itself is we know that when children are exposed to a different language, when they're little that actually different parts of their brain turn on and it does all kinds of fantastic things. So for all students, the bilingual brain is just better. It's a gift. But in addition to that, we want to be able to serve our multilingual learners and their families in an equitable way in birth to five spaces in the Quad Cities. And at WIU, we feel like we can create a good model for that. Now, Western hopes to open the facility in the, in the enterprise loss by August, if I'm not mistaken. That is the goal. We are hoping to do that. We are currently um, working closely with our team at WIU to get the space procured. We have an LOI in place, so letter of intent for that lease space. We are working with funders right now. We have some funds identified already within the university, and I think we can do it. Well, are you <laughs> seeing are you seeing parents actually already contacting you saying, we, I got to get in? 
<laughs> we do have after after kind of um, some of the media pieces came out. We of course do have parents asking that question, and as soon as we have um, the ability to have a wait list or sign up, we will. It is important for us to note that we're really looking to partner closely with organizations that can help us make this space accessible. So we definitely want to look at child care assistance program um, pieces like that because we know that the demographic hit most critically during the pandemic was our linguistically, culturally, and income diverse families. So we will be making that a priority in enrollment and that's really important to us to serve that community. Do you see this as just a seed, like just a beginning? This isn't the end all. Um, what do you see for the future as far as Western's concerned, especially with childcare education? I think, you know, Western has a track of providing lab site um, early childhood space space for, for growth. For example, you know, our, our Macomb site already has a lab school um, that's been up and running for a long time. It looks a little bit differently than ours will because we really believe in designing around the community in which we're going to be serving. And so they do look differently, but that success has already been there as a model for us. We look to get this program going and um, and I think Christy Vinder would agree as she, she talks about it too. The, the dream, right, would be that we get this program full and going and then we look for the next child care desert spot to open another one up. Right now, I'll just be excited to get this one open. But yes, we have had conversations about how do we continue to serve the child care deserts in our community and this is a good start for us. Dr. Lindsay Meeker with Western Illinois University. In a moment, the Republican response to the Pritzker budget plan. But first, warming up during the February chill. Laura Adams says there's plenty you and your friends and family can do during these last weeks of winter as you head out and about. This is Out and About for February 11th through 17th. Everyone is welcome to the Sweetheart Dance on the 11th at the Rock Island Fitness and Activity Center. Or join Ballet Quad Cities for their Valentine gift in Love Stories at the Outing Club the 11th and 12th. Skellington Manor is the location for Five Card Murder, an interactive murder mystery on the 11th. And what do you do when you mix alcohol with a bunch of lovelorn comedians? Join Shots Through the Heart, a Valentine comedy show on the 11th. And on the 12th, it's Bottoms Up Burlesque presenting Bloody Valentine, both at the Speakeasy. Or celebrate with your Valentine at the Factory of Fear Haunted House, the 11th and 12th. Lonesome Fugitive, Iowa's honkiest honky-tonk band plays at Rhythm City Casino the 11th, while improvisers create an entirely new Shakespearean comedic masterpiece in Shakespeare at the Black Box Theater on the 12th at 7.30. Carcanos, the Living Proof Exhibit Opera takes place the 12th at 7.30 at the Bartlett Performing Arts Center. And February is National Skating Month. Join the fun the 13th at the River's Edge at 2.30. Time for three, the Pop Americana Classical Trio perform at the Bettendorf Performing Arts Center on the 17th, while the drama Proof is performed at Galvin Pine Arts Center the 17th and 18th. And auditions for Tuck Everlasting take place at the Spotlight Theater February 12th and 13th. For more information, visit WQPT.org. Thank you, Laura. Governor J.B. Pritzker says the darkest fiscal days are behind the state, saying bills are being paid down, a rainy day fund can be replenished, some taxes can be frozen, and greater investments can be made. Though Republicans applaud some of what the governor said, they say it needs to be more than just a one-year election gimmick funded by federal dollars that will soon go away. We talked with Representative Noreen Hammond, a Republican of Macomb, as the state and Western Illinois University wait to see what will stay in that budget. What was on first blush your opinion of the governor's address? Um, actually, Jim, at first blush, uh, I was encouraged to see that um, a lot of the focus of the budget um, was in the area of education. Um, K through 12 education um, has some significant increases as does higher education. And um, unfortunately for many, many years, uh, that's not been an area of, of focus for um, this administration and previous administrations. 
The other big headline, of course, were the uh, tax changes, the uh, freeze on the gas tax and grocery tax, and, and changes for property tax where you, uh, taxpayers would get some money back. Republicans have welcomed that, but are, I've heard two different things. First off, they say it's short term because it's one year only. And the other is that it's an election year gimmick. Well, um, you know, I never refer to a, a property tax um, freeze or a property tax uh, break as, as a gimmick. Uh, the, the devil is always in the details for these things, certainly. And, um, you know, as far as the gas tax and, and freezing that, uh, how does that affect our um, road fund and the projects that are already in the pipeline? And um, is there going to be enough money in that fund uh, to complete those projects? So those are all questions that we have to ask. We can't just take everything at uh, face value, certainly. Um, but I would also say that uh, this is the governor's uh, plan. This is his outline and um, how he would uh, prefer to see dollars spent. Uh, but the reality is that it is the, uh, the General Assembly uh, that does those appropriations. One of the things Governor uh, Pritzker was touting is he said Illinois will end this fiscal year with a $1.7 billion surplus, the first of its kind in more than 25 years. Let's be honest, that's unheard of in Illinois history, it seems, at least in modern times. Well, it is unheard of, and, and um, you know, I also heard the governor say that uh, skeptics will say this was because we received uh, funding from the federal government. Um, I don't consider myself a skeptic. I consider myself a realist, and uh, the reality is we received over $8 billion from the federal government, and um, much of that is uh, to... Uh, bolster up the state's economies, and it has certainly done that for Illinois' economy. Um, I don't think that is something that we can ignore. Uh, those are dollars that are going into um, our revenue streams and um, helping uh, the, to paint this picture uh, that the governor has painted for us. Also, there was uh, money that's going towards uh, the, the pension fund that is so underfunded in Illinois. And also addition of almost a billion dollars towards what's often called a rainy day fund. I mean, fiscally, those are, those are areas that Republicans certainly wanted to see. Absolutely. And, and um, I am not going to um, suggest that any of this is a bad idea. Um, as a matter of fact, I think um, that many of these ideas uh, coming from the governor and, and his staff are, um, are uh, very laudable. Uh, my concern is um, if, we, if we promise this money and we promise it for this year, um, will we be able to sustain that budget next year and the year after that, um, and in, in fact, uh, make increases uh, caused by inflation um, and, and be able to pay our bills. So um, it, a, a rainy day fund is a terrific idea. We haven't seen that since Governor Edgar was in office and um, paying down our pension debt, which is upwards of $130 billion. Um, absolutely, those are things we need to be doing. What do you see as your greatest priority right now? Well, um, one of my, my greatest priorities right now is um, I have um, some real significant concerns over the money that is owed to our unemployment trust fund. Um, we have um, about uh, nearly $4 billion, about $3.5 billion in debt to our unemployment trust fund. Um, the, the governor uh, has been um, hopeful that the federal government would just say, oh, forget it. You just, you don't know that. Um, that's not going to happen. Not, not in my lifetime or anyone's lifetime. And so uh, we have enough money in what is left of the eight plus billion dollars that we received from the federal government to pay down um, the most significant portion of that debt in the unemployment trust fund. 
Um, the, it is allowable under the federal ARPA regulations that we can use that money to do that. And that in fact is what we should be doing. That is an absolute priority. And the reason is among others that if we don't do that, then the taxes on Illinois employers will go up significantly, significantly to make up for those three and a half billion dollars in debt. I know two things. One is you, you're very interested in uh, higher education because you, mm -hmm. you serve the district that includes Western Illinois University. Yes. Um, and, and you also said that it really is the details of the budget. Um, what do you see right now as far as Western is concerned? I mean, as you well know, th 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 those two years of freezes uh, back a couple of years ago were devastating to the university system in Illinois. Um, and also we've seen declining enrollment on campuses throughout the state, including Western. How do you see Western right now? Do you see it stabilizing and growing or do you still see concerns? Um, actually, I see it um, stabilizing and growing and, and uh, um, I give kudos to uh, President Wong for that. He has been uh, very, very active in, in uh, uh, recruitment and um, it has a, a real focus on retention for our students. And I think that's um, one of the areas that um, oftentimes gets overlooked. You know, you can tout at the beginning of the year or beginning of a semester, um, we have X number of students, but do you still have that number at the end of that semester? And so um, retention is um, equally as important as recruitment. But um, President Wong is doing a, a terrific job. Um, he is focused not just on the Macomb campus um, here, um, but also the Quad City campus. And um, I, I think that as we look at what's going on um, as far as um, jobs in, in this economy, in this state. Um, Western uh, has so much to offer. Um, we all know that there is a significant um, loss in uh, the area of law enforcement. Um, Western has uh, one of the number one law enforcement schools um, across the nation. Um, agriculture is another area that um, is ever expanding and uh, Western is is certainly known for that, as well as their um, business and supply chain. And uh, so those are areas that I see um, Western certainly having an edge um, over many other universities. One other thing that the governor had pointed out is that he wanted to see an increase in uh, Pell grants and an increase in MAP scholarships, a, a $200 million increase in MAP scholarships, and also kind of target some of that towards uh, health care education uh, to increase the number of health care workers. I would assume that you applaud that as well. Uh, absolutely. And, and, and here's the thing. We have, you know, we have talked for years about um, the MAP grant funding and underfunding uh, the MAP grants. And so if we can direct uh, more funding, and I think the governor was around $600 million um, for uh, MAP grant recipients, uh, that would be huge. And, and folks need to understand that the reason for that is MAP grant funding is available to Illinois students that go to school in Illinois. And so that gives us a distinct advantage on keeping our students, um, our Illinois students here in Illinois to go to school. And uh, the other part of that is um, back in 2019, um, I'm part of a higher ed uh, working group and um, it's a, a bicameral uh, bipartisan and by choice uh, that we sit on this uh, working group and we put in place a program uh, the acronym is AIM HIGH and it's a scholarship program again uh, just for Illinois students at our state universities and so um, that is specific to our public universities and that's another area uh, that is also very helpful for our students because it's key that we keep our Illinois students here in Illinois for higher education. Do you think, I mean, because the governor had mentioned that it seems for too long higher education was ignored. Do you think that Illinois has learned something over the last few years that, you know, cutting in the area of higher education actually in the long term is bad? 
Well, I would hope so. And, um, you know, with, with high unemployment as it is now, particularly in the healthcare field, um, this is uh, to have this be a focus and, and change direction a little bit, if you will, um, and actually give um, higher education uh, the dollars that it needs uh, to educate our students, I think is huge. You know, um, I hear, because I'm, I'm very um, active in, in, um, in long-term care and, and senior issues and those kind of things. And um, many of our long-term care facilities, their staffing shortage is significant um, in, in the area of nursing and certainly in CNAs. Uh, many of these temp agencies, um, uh, the, the cost that these facilities have to bear uh, to uh, put in place the staff that they need is unbelievable. So anything we can do uh, to put more folks into that uh, career, and, and uh, it's a great career, by the way, um, and, and, and more and more of that is what's going to be needed in the future. The governor said when it comes to the budget, and I was wondering what you thought of when you heard this, he said seats at the grown up table will be off limits to those who aren't working in the public's best interests. Did that anger you at all? Um, I, I guess uh, anger is one word. Um, I was. I was ashamed for him. Uh, I don't think that kind of rhetoric is necessary. Uh, because at the end of the day, um, I would hope that we would all have seats at the table and it would be one table, not a grown up table and a child's table, um, but the table and that we would all be there um, and, and be able to express what is needed in the areas that we represent. It's a very diverse state. It's diverse um, in, in our population. It's diverse in, in our um, uh, occupations and um, certainly the needs across the state. So um, as I often tell my colleagues, you know, um, I appreciate the districts that you have, you represent and the needs that you have, but make no mistake, you don't have the market cornered on poverty. Illinois State Representative Noreen Hammond, Republican of Macomb. On the air, on the radio, on the web, on your mobile device and streaming on your computer, Thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. Wheeland Presley Funeral Home and Crematory, a proud supporter of WQPT, has been serving Quad City families since 1889. They now have live stream capabilities for viewing your loved one's funeral or memorial service. At IHM VCU, we've always been here for you. You are and always will be our top priority. We care about your financial and physical health, and we are here. IHM VCU is a proud supporter of WQPT.